Good morning, everyone. Wow, this is amazing. It's a great turnout, fantastic energy. I am really delighted to, to, to be here with all of you today. And before I start, I want to just see in the audience, there's a bright spotlight on me, so I can't see very well. But let me see the, um, can I have all those from Baltimore City? Can you all stand up, please? So this is our team from Baltimore, thank you. So together with the mayor, we are thrilled to welcome you all to our city. And we, I, I wish to thank all of our organizers for hosting this just tremendous event. And I was unable to attend it for the first two days, but I've been asking people around about what they've been learning in the first two days. And I'm blown away by all these different outside the box ideas that all of you have been coming up with. And in general, you know, we in the city embrace the concept that it's not just, you can't tackle youth violence prevention only through a criminal justice policing lens. That's the reason why I'm here to speak with you as the health commissioner about how we can see violence as a public health approach or from a public health approach. But let me back up a second. You know, I'm an emergency physician and my greatest privilege and honor is being able to take care of my patients. And so I wanna tell you about a patient of mine who came in after three gunshot wounds. He had been shot twice in the chest and once in the abdomen, 17 years old. So when he came in, we knew what to do. We knew based on the medical approach that what we need to do is to insert a chest tube. We knew that we had to intubate him. We knew that we had to pump him blood. We knew all these medical interventions that we could take. And then, we looked at his chart, and it turned out that he had been in our ER just a month ago for a gunshot wound, two months ago for a stab wound, six months ago because he had punched someone and broke his hand. And as we were working to resuscitate him, I couldn't help but think, how many interventions were there before? How many opportunities were there before for us to intervene? And even beyond that, what else is it that we could have done to prevent that bullet, those bullets that day, from reaching this patient? So that's why, as you go through, and as you go through the rest of your conference, and then go back to everywhere else that you're working, I want to share three thoughts with you, three things that we're doing here in Baltimore City, three approaches that we're taking here in Baltimore City. The first is that, we embrace violence as a public health issue. It's certainly a health issue because there are people dying from violence. But we embrace a public health approach because we do programs like Safe Streets, which is based on the National Cure Violence Model. Through Safe Streets, we hire individuals who are from the communities that they serve. They walk the streets of the city and they intervene. They mediate conflict where they see it occurring. That's a public health approach, recognizing that just like other diseases, violence is something that spreads from person to person, and that's why we're able to interrupt violence where it occurs, with the individuals who are the most credible messengers. We also strongly believe, because we see violence as a public health issue, we also strongly believe that we have to intervene as early as possible, as far upstream as possible. Last month, we launched a program in Baltimore called Vision for Baltimore, which is to get every child glasses who needs them. It's estimated in our city that up to 10,000 children need glasses but aren't getting them. And, you know, I'm all for research and studies, but we don't need another study to show us that if kids don't have glasses, they can't learn. And if kids don't have glasses, maybe they're labeled as being disruptive. They're being put back further in class, in their grades. Actually, when there was one thing that could have been earlier, that could have been done earlier, to prevent them from needing those other youth violence prevention strategies later. So we see something as simple as glasses as a youth violence prevention plan. We see things like preventing lead poisoning as also helping our children be able to achieve their full potential because 
our ethos in public health is that where a child grows up should not determine if that child grows up. That's what we do. And I see that this is something that this audience embraces that this, uh, this is the group that really embraces this. I know I've had conversations with Theron, with many of them, many of our, our representatives here in, um, from DOJ, and all of you really understand the idea that we cannot just look at someone as the perpetrator of violence. And here's the second thing I hope that you all keep in mind. So violence is a public health issue, but also that we cannot think about violence without also addressing trauma. You know, one of the most humbling experiences I had when I came to my position in the city was I was speaking to this group of youth and I had just started and I thought that I knew what these 8 to 13 year olds, I thought I knew what they would want to talk about. The health department, you know, we are also known as the agency of bugs, drugs, and sex. So I thought they would ask me about gonorrhea and smoking and drugs and whatever and I that's what I thought I was there to talk about and I asked these youth assembled just what do you want to talk about and without exception they all said one thing they talked about mental health it blew me away they didn't actually use the words mental health but they talked about trauma they talked about the trauma of being handcuffed in front of their classmates in the school cafeteria and thrown into the back of a police car. They talked about the trauma of growing up so poor that they wouldn't know whether they would have a roof over their heads or food that night. They talked about the trauma of being the only person in their family who gets up in the morning because everybody else in their family is addicted to drugs. And so I think about that experience now because I couldn't have imagined that these eight-year-olds would be telling me about this. But if we are to really make a difference in addressing violence, we have to also look at individuals not as the perpetrators of violence, but also the victims of deep trauma. Deep trauma that likely has been unexpressed for a long time. And it's not, part of it is mental health. And yes, there is a lot of stigma around mental health. And yes, we have been incarcerating for decades individuals who need help for mental health. Rather than, that, rather than treating it. But it's also about trauma because it shouldn't just be that when somebody gets a mental health diagnosis, that mental illness diagnosis, that that's when they get help for their trauma. And that's what we began doing in this city. We now have mental health services available in nearly 120 of our schools. We've also begun doing, under our Deputy Commissioner Olivia Farrow, who's here somewhere, um, there she is. Okay, so we've also started doing trauma-informed care trainings where, um, thanks to support from SAMHSA, we are training all of our frontline city workers on how to recognize and treat the effects of trauma. So that, I hope that all of you will keep that in mind too, that we have to aim upstream in violence, but then we also have to address the impact of trauma. Third, this is one thing I know you've all talked about a lot in the conference already. Make sure to look at other related issues as well. One of the core principles of public health is we believe health is related to everything, right? If our kids aren't healthy, they can't learn. But the other way around too, that lack of education also impacts poverty, which then impacts health. The same when it comes to violence as well. Can't look at violence without addressing trauma, but we also can't look at violence without addressing addiction. And something that we've done in the city is to make it clear that our principles are, thanks to our mayor, that our principles are that addiction is, a, is an illness, is a disease, and that we have to focus first and foremost on saving lives, which is the reason why last year we got legislation passed so that as of October of 2015, I issued a blanket prescription for the antidote, the opioid antidote naloxone to 620,000 residents of our city. You know, we knew that there were more people in our city dying from overdose than are dying from homicide. And at the same time, addiction is so closely tied to all these other issues in criminal justice as well, that most of our drug arrests are for 
are related to drugs in or uh, of arrests are, are related to drugs in some way. So we recently are piloting a program together with the state's attorney's office, together with the police department and many of our partners around the city, including our behavioral health authority, behavioral health system Baltimore, called LEAD, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion, such that individuals who are caught with small amounts of drugs are going to be offered treatment instead of incarceration. That's the direction that we have to turn to look at how violence is tied to all these other issues as well. So I want to end with three ideas. Three ideas that I hope all of you will take back with you when you go back to all the important work that, 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 that you're doing. The first idea is to call out the problems that we see. Just like in medicine, if we don't diagnose the problem, we can't treat it. And there are so many issues that we see, and it's going to take courage, but we have to call them out. So call out poverty as a public health issue, call out violence as a public health issue, call out racism as a public health issue. Let's make sure that we address them, but we can't address them without first recognizing that they exist in the first place. Second, don't be afraid to look outside the box and to partner with individuals who might be surprising partners for you. Here in the city, under our mayor's direction, we have been leading partnerships that not only see violence with the police department, state's attorney's office, but also with health, also with our, with our neighborhood groups, also with our faith leaders, with so many others here in our city who are embracing this call to action. So don't be afraid to look outside the box and think, can I think about getting glasses as a violence prevention strategy? Can I think about lead pain prevention? Can I think about nurse home visiting? This is what I can think about in health, in your respective fields. There probably are other things that may be non-traditional ways of conceptualizing violence, but may be just the answer that you're looking for. Third, don't forget to do something right now. Don't wait. And specifically, I've been thinking about this because right after this event, and I'm afraid that I'm going to have to go after this, but right, right, right after this event, I'll be headed to a press conference with our members of our, our Baltimore members of, of Congress, with Congressman Cummings, with Congressman Sarbanes, um, and that's um, a call to action, national call to action by Representative John Lewis, who, as you know, last week to stage the sit-in around gun violence and why we need to address gun violence. I think, you know, having seen so many of my patients getting shot and killed, having seen in our communities, it's not just one event that happens, one tragic event that happens. It's also here in our city. Last year, 300 people died from gun violence. When we look to see the trauma that our communities are feeling every day, when, when we see our 14-year-old patients getting shot in the neck and being paralyzed from the neck down. When we see our three-year-old patients who get shot in the head and are now brain dead, I mean, this is what we see every day. We can't wait to take action. If I were in the ER and I were seeing a patient of mine who were unresponsive, if I saw a patient of mine who has, who has heart disease and cancer, who was in a car accident, and I don't know what's happened to this person, it may be very complicated. The solution may take many, may take a long time. The solution may not even work initially. It would never be an option to wait. Would never be an option to say, well, let me let somebody else handle that. Let me, you know, I know this is too complicated, so let me wait for the oncologist to come in. Let me wait for the heart surgeon. It would never be an option to wait. And so I hope we see the call to action for gun violence, the call to action for violence, the call to action for youth violence, all this is urgent. We feel that fierce urgency of now all of us in this room feel that urgency. So let's do something now. Let's aim for action. Let's call, the, let's call to action. Let's call out the problems that we see. And let's continue to make a difference in our communities to save lives. Thank you all very much.